I guess the, 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 the counter argument would be look at all the work that's done with say addiction services to help people. Um, now we know that a lot of people with support can come out of addiction, whether it's through fentanyl, whether it's, you know, the, the really serious stuff, the opiates, alcohol, but without support and without help and without that clinical intervention, it's exceedingly more difficult. Recidivism in rehab, and mm -hmm. I've spent 10 years in re rehab centers. Mm -hmm. Recidivism in rehab, the rate of recidivism within one year mm -hmm. is 81%. Okay. That means you go through rehab and you have an 81% chance to go back on your drug of choice, alcohol, what have you. Mm -hmm. If you, and that's one year, and we measure only one year, recidivism only in one year. And you know why? Mm. Because if we were to measure five years, the rate would be almost 100%. So okay. rehab centers are the greatest conceivable scam. The greatest conceivable scam. And they combine talk therapy with medication, with, uh, you know, they have all the trappings of a science. There is no treatment in medicine, none, that is so poor. None, and that includes cancer. Mm. The only comparable thing is pancreatic and liver cancer. So if you were looking for a model, an interventionist model, to help from your perspective, where, where would you start then? If you're saying the rehab centers don't work. Uh, the rehab centers don't work. That's a fact. So how would you, where would you start by offering some help and some treatments to say people that are in the grips of severe addiction, right? Are you saying no intervention and no rehab centers, no clinical? Definitely intervention. Okay. You should provide them with clean needles. You should provide them with drug substitutes. Okay. You should provide them with kits for overdose against, okay. to counter overdoses. Of yeah. course you should intervene. You well, that's intervene. more, that intervention is more of a supporting and enabling as opposed to um it's preventing preventing the adverse outcomes of drug addiction overdoses yeah. for example because there's nothing you can do about it and anyone who tells you that there is something you can do about drug addiction mm. is lying to you through its teeth through its teeth it's a lie it's not even a myth it's a straightforward lie you don't have to trust me once this program is over, go online. Check mm. check recidivism recidivism rates for rehabs. Yeah, I have. I do have. I have looked at this anecdotally. I don't have the stats in front of me. Um, what I I heard that recidivism in the first year was ninety percent was higher than eighty one percent. Actually, it's eighty one. But because, uh, eighty one, I mean, for all all substance abuse disorders, mm -hmm. it's true that uh, alcoholism, for example, is eighty percent. And some other types of drugs are close to 100. Mm -hmm. So when you average them, it's about 81. Yeah, 81 is bad. Mm. 81 is seriously bad. This is the remission rate in pancreatic and liver cancer, which are the two deadliest forms of cancer and have no cure. Mm. Yeah. This is seriously bad. It is. We yeah. don't know what is addiction. We have had the nonsensical hypothesis of addictive personality, which has now been luckily finally discarded. We have not. We don't have a clue what is an addiction. We know, of course, that addiction changes biochemical reactions in the brain, pathways creates new pathways, and we, we know. We have fMRIs. We have nice toys. We like to play with these toys. They're very colorful, you know, mm. and they impress the layman. And they, it's good that they impress the layman because laymen pay taxes, and then you can get grants, and you can live the rest of your life off the grants. Mm. This is the way science works, so-called science works. So, but the truth is we have no idea what is addiction. Actually, a few years ago, when I was still involved with, with uh, on the right side of drugs and alcohol, I mean, in the rehab side, I suggested in, in a series of uh, peer-reviewed articles, I suggested that addiction is actually a positive thing. And the reason I suggested it is because about one third of the brain is geared to tackle addictions. It's as if we have a machine here that is built to generate addictions <clears throat> and then to manage them. 
Now, why, from the point of view of evolution, why would we end up with a brain whose possibly main task is addiction? Like the addiction areas in the brain, for example, the dopaminergic uh, pathway and so on, the addiction areas are about 10 times larger than the areas that deal with language, Broca's organ and so on. If you put all the areas that deal with language, mm. they are 10% of the areas that deal with addiction. Why? If addiction was a bad thing, a horrible thing and so on, why mm. would our brain, why do we have receptors? Why do we have receptors for cannabinoids and endorphins? Yeah. And, yeah. And why? So mm. I suggested that actually addiction is a positive thing, not a negative thing. It's something involved in learning, in attachment, in bonding, love is a form of addiction, clearly. There is definitely an addictive process between newborn and mother. And now I'm talking biology, not psychology. There's no psychology at this age. Mm. So it seems that addiction predisposes us to social connections, on the one hand, getting attached and bonded, not only to human beings, but also to objects or whatever. And then, of course, some people are going to misuse it. Of course, some people are going to abuse this mechanism. As they, some people abuse, abuse reading. They read too much. Some people abuse, I don't know, well, watching, well, like, binge, well, like, binge watching. Yeah, well, like, well, I guess some pastimes are constructive. Um, some are not. The If you were to add up all of the potential addictions that people suffer from, right? So you have food, sex, you've got um, all of the negative stuff drugs, alcohol, porn. You could be looking at over 85, 90% of the general population, in at least in Western society. I yes. mean, you, you, you could even be getting close to, not, to 100. Everybody has something. So I, I, I take your point, right? I take your point that there does seem to be some kind of biological wiring in there that predisposes us to pursue maybe in an obsessive compulsive way but then you could argue that that gives us the human drive to is related to the human drive to achieve like how would you get a man on the moon if somebody why wasn't you, obsessed? why would you get why would you get a man on the moon yeah that's precisely that's precisely the issue not how but why mm. it's precisely the issue i agree with you fully today maybe 100 percent of the population are addicted one way or another some addictions are more benign than benign others. yeah but Overall, I agree. Why? Because we have created a civilization that encourages addictions. So environment is at, at the core of addiction. We have, we, we incentivize, we mm. have a set of incentives that encourages addiction. For example, consumerism. Food. What we food. put into food, additives in food, I mean, that's a whole podcast Additive, by itself. Social, social media, mm. consumerism, mm. these are all forms of addiction. Mm. So, it seems that we have chosen addiction as mm. the main mode of existence, as an existential mode. Mm. It doesn't mean that addiction is bad. It, it means that collectively we mm. are making bad use of it. Mm. So, uh, Can we define addiction by saying that addiction only really becomes addiction when it's outside of our control? When, the, yes. when what we're doing is we are not in control of the pastime. Yes, and then it's not it, a bad thing. Yeah. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. For example, I don't think a baby is in control of his addiction to his mother. Mm. Uh, or, mm. And vice versa, by the way, it's a mutual addiction. I don't mm. think it's a bad thing at all. In, mm. in itself, it's not a bad thing. Mm. Of course, if you make it an organizing principle of life, mm. and also a principle that imbues life with meaning, makes sense of life, mm. because the junkie... You know, I, I've worked with junkies. Mm -hmm. The addiction provides him with a with an agenda, a timetable, a goal. Uh, you know, it becomes it becomes his bible. It becomes his his raison d'être. Um, addiction helps him to socialize. Addiction has massive social dimensions, mm -hmm. and addiction, of course, has psychological components. And of course, in due time, it affects the brain. It's very difficult to reverse, and and so on and so forth. So addiction is a complex, such a complex phenomenon that to reduce it to a sentence like 
uh, we can treat it, I think is counterproductive and counterfactual. Mm. I don't think we have a clue what is addiction. And we're beginning. In 100 years' time, we may have. Right now, we don't have. Mm. Um, I, I, I suspect environment, we will, we will discover over time that environment um, and people's personal lives play a greater part in the behavior than we would have. Um, it's like the famous study of the American GIs coming back from Vietnam. You you know about this study, right? Um, a lot of them are using opioids on a daily basis. They get out of the environment, they come back to the United States, um, and 85, over 85% 85 of them just stopped using clearly an environmental impact. But that's what you just said. I yeah. said we've constructed a civilization mm. that incentivizes, rewards, mm. positively reinforces if mm. you want to use a con concept from behaviorism, mm. positive reinforces addiction. Mm, 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 mm. Addiction is cued by the environment. Addiction is a response to signaling. And when you get the right set of rewards and positive reinforcements, mm. then you choose. It's a choice. You choose to be. How do I know that addiction is a choice? Because I have seen the most god-awful addicts Give it up in a day, literally. Literally. If this were really a brain disease, if this were really something biological and neurological and so on, you could not give it up in a day. Addiction is absolutely a choice. From 10 years of exposure to this field, I'm absolutely convinced it's a choice. However, of course, it's a choice that has impacts on the brain. But it's a choice that is, I agree with you fully, environmentally cued. It's a reaction to the environment. If you were, if you live in Saudi Arabia, you're extremely unlikely to become an alcoholic. Of course, everyone, you could drink in secret and end up being decapitated or something. Mm. But, but you're very unlikely to become an alcoholic mm. because you're not exposed to alcohol bottle, bo alcohol in bottles. You're not exposed to visuals. You're not exposed to advertising. You're not exposed to your friends drinking and offering you a drink. You're not exposed to bars. You're not a... Clearly, mm. the environment conditions you to not be an alcoholic, exactly mm. as it conditions you to be an alcoholic. Mm. Same goes when it comes to sex addiction, for example. Same goes. Same. I think all addictions are. Um, uh, Pornography is a particularly pernicious one because it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Which? Um, Pornography is Pornography. particularly pernicious one because of the, the damage it's going to it's it's going to have on pair bonding relationships. Here there's a, a, a bit of a problem with the science. We still don't have studies that conclusively demonstrate that there is addiction to pornography. Mm. So, while I understand what you're saying, and I have come across people who can't stop, which is a test of addiction. Mm. You can't stop. You really want to stop and you can't stop. I've come across such people. I've come even across people who damage their genitalia, masturbating and so on. Mm. So probably it is an addiction. I'm not disputing this. But at this stage, there's no foundation. There's no scientific foundation. Mm. There are no studies that corroborate it. What is clear, and there, of course, uh, there are studies by Zimbardo and many others. What is clear is that pornography shapes the way people who are exposed to pornography regard sex, sexuality, sexual interactions, sexual orientations, mm. and permissible and, and impermissible acts in, in sex, et cetera, et cetera. So shapes what we call sexual scripts. Mm. Until the 1950s and 1960s, sexual scripts were handed down from one generation to the next. A sexual script tells you how to flirt, how to have, what is allowed in sex and what is not allowed in sex, what mm. constitutes coercion and rape and what doesn't, how to interact with the with the other party and so on. So this mm. is known as a sexual script. Today, sexual script is determined by peers, peers and pornography, the two peers, mm. peers and pornography. Mm. And peers derive their scripts from pornography, so ultimately pornography. Mm. And today, when young people go to a room to have a one-night stand, they reenact 
pornographic acts. So that's why, for example, choking, choking has been described in well over 80% of one night stands under the age of 25. Similarly, anal sex is now more predominant than vaginal sex in one night stands. In heterosexual in heterosexual couples, encounters. couples among age group under, under 25. Why? Because anal sex and choking, and these are porn, porn uh, tropes. These are, you know, see them on, on Pornhub. Mm. And of course, the objectification of the, and I'm talking, I'm limiting myself to heter heter heterosexual sex. Mm. Of course, the objectification of the woman, um, and to some extent, the humanization of the woman, about 10% of women report having had an orgasm in a one night stand compared to 53% of men. So it's like the man is using the woman's body to masturbate. Her. Yeah. Um, and so, so all this is, is pornography. Yeah. Let me ask you kind of a, a legislative you know, you know one, question. Uh, just one thing which yeah. I think would, would interest your, your viewers. Yeah. The problem with pornography is this the human mind, the human brain, I'm sorry, cannot tell the difference between three-dimensional flesh and blood visuals and two-dimensional visuals on the screen. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. The brain wow. cannot tell the difference. So when the brain is exposed mm -hmm. to two-dimensional pictures, moving pictures on a, on a screen, the brain has had sex. The brain believes that it, it has had sex. It's it, it's not taking in the physical sense of the touch, the, the third dimension. It's not it's it not has, incorporating it has, that. Not really. The, mm -hmm. And that's why men, for example, are the main consumers of pornography. Mm. And also men are titillated and aroused by visuals, mm. while women are titillated and aroused by text. Story. Story, narratives, mm. text, mm. and so on. Mm. So if you say and if you say to a woman something nice, if you if you're nice to a woman, if you if you if you have a way with words, if you're eloquent. You're much more likely to get in her pants, sorry for the expression, than if you're a hunk. Mm -hmm. But a man would be attracted to a look. Yeah. Yes, to a good looking. Let, let me ask, this might be outside uh, your remit, but for, from a philosophical, legislative point of view, if you were asked, pardon me, should we ban hardcore pornography, not just for under 18s? I have a uh, Dr. Richard Hogan, uh, one of my former guests, is launching a campaign to suppress the proliferation of pornography for under 18s. And I was thinking about it, just banning it wholesale. What would your perspective be? Would it create a black market? Would you go, yes, listen, this 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 offers no value to society whatsoever. Let's just get rid of it completely. The problem is that there's no sex education. Mm. The only sex education available is through pornography. Mm. In the in the United States, for example, there's no sex education. Mm. And whatever sex education there is, it's rudimentary. It's it doesn't tackle problems that young people face. It's a, so they use pornography as a teaching moment, an instrument. So you think improved sex education would offset the damage, the societal damage by pornography? Unboundaried sex education. Mm. Sex education where you're allowed to talk about anything and everything. Mm. And you're going to get authoritative answers from non-blushing adults. Mm. People need to grow up. So it's, while maybe ethically and so on, it's, it's a good idea, mm. um, it, it won't work. Mm. It won't work. People will consume pornography illegally, like they do today on the dark web and so on. You mm. have types of pornography that you can consume only on the dark web. Mm. Snuff pictures, for example. Mm. Not real, they're simulated, but never mind. Mm. Snuff pictures, only on the dark web, you can't see. Uh, real incest, forget what you get via Google, that's not real incest. But mm. you do have real incest pornography on the dark web, in real time sometimes. Mm. You have on the dark web. They are prescribed, they're illegal, you could go the rest of your life to prison for some of these things, and yet they're available. What's a dark web? You have a, a Tor browser, you're in the dark web. So there's no intervention, um, really, that we could make that would stop somebody who's... It would stop people who are 
less determined, if you like. You can't stop people who are wholeheartedly determined to get access to that kind of stuff. But you would stop people inadvertently falling um, into it. That's a short clip from episode 33 with Professor Sam Vaknin. For the full episode, click somewhere round about down here. And for the subscribe button, it should be somewhere over here. A big shout out to everybody that has subscribed so far. I appreciate each and every one of you. Um, here's to fantastic, prosperous, successful, healthy, and fun filled 2024. I've got some really interesting guests lined up, people I think you'll be interested in hearing from. I certainly know I'll be interested in talking to. So here's to 2024, everybody. Thank you so much.